All right, hi, Richard Moore, and uh, well, hello, Facebook. And it's Thursday, which means, of course, time for a Q&A on sales. It's been a little while, I think, since we've done this. I think it's been a, a week or so, and what I've tried to do is get some kind of content at one o'clock on a Thursday, because I know a lot of people will like to watch it. So what I've done differently today is there are a couple of questions, and if you have any questions on sales, of course, write them in the comments, and we'll answer them uh, for you right here. But I wanted to share a couple of things that have happened uh, during uh, some of the coaching I've done recently. Um, um, I was in London uh, yesterday, I was in London the day before as well, uh, and I'm, I'm doing a lot of coaching with different sales teams with different kinds of um, uh, business propositions, everything from law to media sales, uh, and it's interesting that a lot of the fundamentals are the same, but seriously, there are... Um, there's some really important, interesting things that came out of the training, and I really thought I'd like to share that uh, because it impacts people so much. I mean, if it comes to doing cold calling, especially on the phone uh, or meeting people, knocking on doors, whatever it is, there are some things that are really essential. It's quite interesting because um, I also had a conversation with someone about um, performance, uh, and I think it's worth sharing this. He Basically, this guy um, had been at a company for about a year, uh, and this, I don't know if this is familiar, this is maybe something that you've been through as well, but uh, you know, it depends, but this guy had been for a, his job for about a year and he was in a sales role. Now what happened was he basically had um, uh, done really poorly. I mean, like, he'd done what someone normally might do in a month, in a year. I don't know how he was still there, to be honest. And what he was doing was he was making all the right sounds. So this, this sales exec was, um, you know, he was turning up early, leaving late. He was trying to be on the phone all the time. He made it look like he was busy. He was finding new leads he could call. He was writing all notes. Everything looked so good, but he wasn't getting any sales. So fundamentally, there's a lot of stuff missing, you, you might think. And what I said to him was, if you've been here a year, right, and my job is often, and doesn't make me very popular, because I tell people as it is, and they don't necessarily like hearing the truth, but that's how it is. And um, when I said, look, you've been here a year, and lesser people with less experience are killing it and overtaking you in terms of how much money you've made, and you're not. And so, What's happening here is you've chosen to do something in a certain way. You've found great leads, people you should be calling. You're making lots of dials every day, but there's something missing. And what it turns out, it, what it turns out is that that, that team uh, has a target of n the number of pitches or people they're gonna speak to each day. This guy who's totally underperforming always hits that number but what it turns out is that he's speaking to the wrong person and the reason why his company requires him to pitch the top guy which is what you should do you should pitch a decision maker right if you're going to sell anything you should pitch the person who's going to be buying it uh, ultimately and um the reason why he pitches the wrong person so goes much further down the food chain in the companies he's pitching is because they take his call and the reason they and because they take his call and listen to him, he feels comfortable, all right. And if he feels comfortable, he then uh, feels a bit more confident and happier about himself. Then he follows through and does his uh, demonstration of his product. Now, what happens is that he ends his day ticking all the boxes. In so far as he's found new companies to call, he has called the company, so his number of dials and phone time, times that this company monitors is, is on point, but also he's able to tick the box that says, I've done X number of pitches today. And he's doing it because it's keeping his manager off his back, right? Because it looks like, well, I'm doing everything right, so you can't blame me if I'm not getting sales. The problem is, if you pitch the wrong guy, you never really get there any money. And so the alternative, as he knows, is if he pitches the right guy, it will be really hard for him to get hold of them by comparison. It will be more likely that that person might reject him or not be so interested. It will be more likely that he doesn't get as many pitches out there during the day. And then he's got his manager on his back because that particular number's not being hit. So what I said to him was, you need to choose your pain, okay? So what this guy was doing was choosing the wrong pain, okay? And this is so important if you're involved in, in any kind of sales at all. It's 
typically going to be painful anyway, right? If he chose to pitch the right guy, he probably wouldn't get as many of them on the phone because they're harder to reach, but he would make money. So he has to deal with the fact he's got his manager on his back saying, why aren't you making enough pitches during, during the day? But he would get used to it. He would push himself. It would be quite ugly, but he would end up making a load of, uh, it wouldn't end up making money in the long run. The alternative pain that he has currently chosen is comfort zone pain, where he doesn't have his manager on his back quite as much, because even though he's not making sales, what he is doing is trying really hard and he's got the right attitude and he's making loads of great sounds. He's on the phone all the time and it looks like he's doing great pitches, but he just never pitches the right guy. So he has convinced himself, or rather the best word is he's conditioned himself to be able to deal with this self-flagration and basically deal with this self-abuse he's putting on himself because he's not making any money and he must be terribly bored and upset with it all, but he's made it okay to focus on just doing things that make him look busy, right? Rather than go out there and make the money. And so whenever there's a sales meeting with his team, he looks down at the ground forlornly because he's never, he's never making any money. He's not one of those key players who's one of their champions. He's just there along for the ride. And it's embarrassing and it's a bit difficult for him and he cringes a bit when they talk about how many sales they've got to do and everyone kind of makes him feel okay about it. But So that kind of pain is still rubbish, but it's a bit embarrassing. What he needs to be doing is focusing on real pain but the kind of pain that gets him results where he's then proud of himself. So you just is there a real lesson there? Choose your pain. If you decide not to push yourself to take the initiative and do the hard stuff that are actually going that you probably know deep down is going to get you really great results in your sales. If you choose not to do that and you choose instead to try and um, condition yourself or or you know, uh, make yourself believe that the excuses you'll tell yourself are okay as to why you're not going to step outside of your comfort zone. And by the way, you'll never share those things with anyone else. They are things that you only have as a conversation with yourself. Then you've chosen the wrong pain. And what's going to happen is it's going to be rubbish. It's going to be difficult either way, but at least one way you get proud of yourself and you make a load of income as opposed to, and you push yourself and and there's all these great things as well but it's hot it's probably harder as opposed to being being soft basically and and convincing yourself that it's okay to to not be so great because you can get by on with whatever you have and it's a really it's a real sad way of looking at things and i said to this guy look you've been here a year and i said i'm not telling you off i'm just saying look i think you're a great guy but you're you're you've you're doing 40 hours a week which isn't even that much, but 40 hours a week because he does his nine to five job um, doing this. And these are your best waking hours, your best hours that you're spending um, creating a perception that you're really trying hard and, and, and re- being really busy, but it's all vacuous, it's pointless. It's like doing door to door sales and only ever speaking to the child when they answer the door because they will hear you and you can sell a child easily, but they won't buy anything. You've got to take the slightly more painful route of trying to get hold of the the top person, the, the father or mother or homeowner and sell to them instead. It sounds absurd, right? But this is what this guy was doing. And he chose that pain. He would prefer that comfort zone pain rather than putting himself out there and getting maybe less pitches out there each day because more people slam the phone down or or close the door in his face given what he's selling. But in the long run, you end up looking yourself in the mirror and saying, I'm really proud actually because I've made myself, I've doubled my money this month or something like that. Okay, so really think on that. Is probably painful whatever you're doing in sales, so choose the correct pain. Don't choose the pain where you try and convince yourself it's okay to sit in the comfort zone and not call the make the difficult calls. 
focus in uh, on, on the hard stuff because it's going to be hard anyway, but get yourself a great result from it. If you guys are, are listening now uh, on, the, on the sales uh, Q&A and you have a question about sales, anything at all, do, uh, thanks very much by the way for sharing it guys that are doing that right now, do put a, a, a comment uh, in the, uh, or a question in the comments. Um, like I said, I, I, I actually um, was unable to do the uh, Q&A uh, last week uh, and so, uh, and before that I'd done a couple of videos to make sure there was some, still some content, but really what I wanted to do today was discuss a couple of things that I experienced when I was being coached and when I was coaching in the last couple of days in London. Um, but also answer a couple of questions of yours as well. So if you want to fire something over, that helps. Danny, thanks very much for, for popping a comment there. So in that sense, how do we refocus our vision to set ourselves back on a trail to better skates, uh, skates and profits? Any tips? Do you take a huge take back and do you take a huge take, uh, step back and evaluate it all? What you do need to do is understand that if you've been in a space for a long time. This guy had been selling for a year, right? And he genuinely, his sales, his career sales totaled what someone would do in a fairly decent month. Like, so terrible sales he was doing. And um, he was so conditioned, and I could tell, this is why I spent about 20, that's fine, in sales, I see you were saying, that he was so conditioned when I was speaking to him, I could tell I needed to spend time with him. And the reason why was because he was nodding and like, yeah, 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 I know, I know, but I don't want to hear it, was what he was saying. Um, what he has to do and what you need to do is you do need to step back and evaluate it. You do need to have a word with yourself about what you're going to choose to do. But the thing is, you do know already that you've chosen the wrong pain. There's no way that someone who decides not to pitch the, the top person or doesn't, who, who never asks for the sale or who, who doesn't back their product enough in the sense that they always discount huge amounts uh, or they never try and push for the top package or they never ask for an upsell. They never push to that extra level. There's no, there's no way that that person doesn't know that, that, that they're doing that. Okay, They're choosing to do it because they, they don't want that rejection. And what's happening is they're choosing to put their emotional frailty and preserving how they feel in the moment ahead of the success of, them, of their career. And I say this to entrepreneurs all the time, to startup business owners. There's a, a guy, uh, uh, one of my clients recently, and I hope, I'm sure he won't mind me saying, he's really concerned about putting himself online in terms of uh, video. So he says, you know, my girlfriend laughs at me because whenever there's a photo even, let alone a video, I, I turn away. I don't really want my, I don't like it. And I said, but the kind of business you're running, I don't need to go into detail what it is, but the kind of business he's running requires it. In 2017, you need that kind of thing. You know, you can get by without it, but it's like it, with video he would win so well so big and the thing is he's deciding not to use video because of how he feels and that is for him superseding what the business needs and your business when it comes to working on your business what the business needs must supersede what you want okay it has to because otherwise what you're doing is you're tripping up your own business because you don't feel in the mood for it. If you're feeling a bit tired or lazy, oh what, does your business have to wait to, until you get motivated? This is why I talk about all, this all the time, this idea of not waiting until you're motivated emotionally to do something. Just do it anyway. If you're motivated, happy days. If you're not, just carry on anyway just do it and it's easier said than done to start with but after a while you do naturalize to it i mean the the idea of every single week twice a week hopping on facebook live and spending an hour answering questions is it's thrilling to me but if it wasn't so much but i knew my business needed it i would still do it even if i just wanted to lay about reading a book eating a you know a chocolate bar i still would do it because it's the business that requires it and when i'm working on my business it's more important than how i feel in the moment so i suppose to answer your question there danny yes he needs to take a step back and evaluate it but he knows deep down that he's doing it anyway and 
what you've got to do is, t is say to yourself, or sometimes you need someone to, to, t to say to you, look, time's gonna go pretty, pretty quickly. And I, I remember saying to, to this guy, I feel like a bit of a granddad, but I said, 10 years will rock it. And I know people who are my age, I, I'm 36 now, but I know people who are my age who are still renting you know, and at the end of the month they're broke and they are living on credit cards and it's because way back they weren't making that decision to, to do the hard stuff. I call it running through walls, you know, like the Hulk, like run through walls. That's what you need to do when you've got the, when you've got the chance, like when you're in your 20s or whatever, not when people are depending on you, not when you've got a, a house to pay for or cars and a, and a kid and things like that. So. It's all a bit touchy-feely, but w what you do need to do is say, it's going to be painful anyway, let's just go for the, the hard stuff. Now, something I've mentioned recently is if you find it difficult to get hold of managing directors, sure, it's going to be difficult, and it might mean that you decide to convince yourself not to do it. So what you need to try and do is readjust or recalibrate your objectives. Now, an extroverted, strong, confident salesperson will have goals or object objectives such as when I dial this number or when I knock on this door or when I shake this guy's hand, I'm going for a sale. OK, now that's all well and good. And that's the kind of you know, rhetoric that that kind of person would love and that gets them pumped. But when you have an introverted, shy person, maybe a business owner who knows they have to sell, but doesn't really feel up to it because it's not their kind of natural space. It's not in their DNA. Well, you can't say man up get it together and just do it because that's not the language and that's not particularly intelligent as a solution. What you do need to do is recalibrate the objectives, okay, because not everyone is like that. So what you need to do is say, for instance, with something like a Facebook Live, if someone was nervous about doing it, is rather than saying, oh, just bloody do it, you have to say, well, you know what, your objective shouldn't be do the world's greatest Facebook Live, it should be turn up. OK, so your, your objective is press go live, press the button and put yourself on the camera, talk for a minute about anything. Most people probably even won't watch it anyway. Or if they do, they'll probably be quite supportive because they'll be your friends and then finish. So your, your objective is participate. And I remember doing this with a guy and it was game changing for him. He got himself in this, this weird kind of funk where he, he did global sales on the phone. This was about uh, two months ago. I remember consulting with him and he, was, he had this weird thing about calling the US. He, he completely sold himself that the US were out to get him, that they saw through his phone calls. He had a lot, a lot, a lot basically a lack of belief in himself. He thought, I'm calling people up. I'm trying to dupe them into taking my call. And it's like, no, man, you've got a really good product. And what happened was he was, he was fearing calling the US because he thought that the receptionists or, or gatekeepers would call him out on being a sales guy and not put him through. Yeah that's gonna happen, but he'd done it to the point where he didn't call them at all because emotionally he wanted to avoid that kind of eject rejection just to kill it off completely, which is a crazy because it's one of the biggest markets for his product area. So what I said was, instead of having the objective of trying to get a pitch out to someone in the stage, your objective is just to make the call. So if you've made the call and someone picks up the phone, objective is complete it's now a successful phone call. And what we did is we recalibrated his objectives because it was the kind of thing he needed right then. There was no amount of me battering him saying, you've got to make the call. Not that was my job or how I would do it anyway. That was going to make him go, oh, okay, I'm convinced. Because the moment, the, if the manager had done that, the moment they'd walked away, he would have stopped calling the US because he just didn't want to do it. You could argue this person needs to go off somewhere else and do a different kind of job. No, he's a really good salesperson. He just convinced himself the US wasn't a good place to work because it, it affected his emotional state. And he knew it was absurd. This is what I'm saying earlier. He, he knew he was doing it. He would sit there and say, I know it's stupid. I just don't want to do it. And I'm making money anyway, calling elsewhere. And I said, no, you need to solve this problem because the US is an epically large market for your, for your product. So his objective was, I'm going to take all the companies I can call in the States, and the objective is once a day for one hour, I'm going to try it for two weeks, I will call them, and the objective is to just dial the number, and if someone picks up, great. 
that's the objective complete. If it goes any further, happy days. If they push back and say, well, we don't think we're gonna take this call, then you just, you have permission to say, do you know what, no problem, thanks so much, hang up the phone. And suddenly by giving himself permission to fail, he actually moved to a place where he was like, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll happy make the calls now because now the, the objective was different. And we got to a great place there because two weeks later when I, I sort of said, you know, how did it go? He said, I'm disgusted with this because it went really well because I had nothing to lose. I hit my objective on every single call, which was just to participate. And he said, basically like two days out of every three, I'd get people on the phone who then pass me through to the decision maker. Then I'd make, uh, you know, then I'd actually do a pitch. And he got a sale in the first week and he had like some great pipeline in the second week because he was doing it. And he said, I'm just annoyed with myself because before I was creating these reasons why I shouldn't do it when in fact it wasn't all that bad. And so what happened was we were able to raise the objective bar. And so then the objective moved because he was feeling more comfortable with it and he even got a sale. We moved it then to, you know, get the managing director on the phone, or president on the phone, get the decision maker to take the call. And that was his objective. And so he'd go into a call going, all I have to do is get this decision maker to pick up the phone. And if that happens, I've achieved success. That's it. If he speaks to me, then it's a massive bonus. If he continues to speak to me and even look at my product, then I'm seriously winning, but that's not my objective. And so then we leveled him up again. And this is what shy, introverted, scared people should be doing. If you have to sell, which you pretty much do if you're in sales, or of course, if you're running your own business, you have to sell in some way, you've got to do it, but it may be you need to recalibrate your objectives. Now, as I say, that's, that's only for that type of personality because that was the solution for them. There are people I know who are very strong-willed, confident people, they totally back themselves, and they're more the people where if they're, if they're kind of playing up a bit with themselves going, oh, I don't know if I can do this, you need to tell those kind of people, do you know what, just get on with it. So if you're, in a co if you're a confident kind of person, the kind of person who backs himself, but you're in a bit of a weird space, you know what, just get on with it and do it. Be a, you know, grow up a bit. And some people need to be told in that way. So it's interesting how things are very different. So if you're new, you just write, oh my God, that's me. Which one? Which Are you the introvert, the shy guy, or are you the confident one who just needs to be told to get on and do it? Which one are you? Uh, and I'd be interested to hear from anyone else as well. But does this resonate? This stuff is... Uh, a way to get yourself back on track or to start and it's so important if you're starting out in sales and you're apprehensive of course you'd be apprehensive why wouldn't you be you're going to speak to or connect with people you don't know and they might reject you right so socially we're hardwired to not like that and and avoid it and of course then it may be that you're that you you win big so uh, Venu here firstly it's an amazing, ironic thing that you've done here is you've been really uh, extroverted and shared in public that you are a shy guy, so well done you. But yeah, so Vinu, if you're a shy guy and you're an introvert and you need to sell, what you've got to do, you've got to do, is you've got to say, it doesn't matter if I don't get a sale straight away. I told this, there's a, there's a business I was coaching, in, another one in London recently, and she, she was like, this is it. I put all my savings into this. This is a brand new business. It has to work. And she was setting herself up to fail every single day, okay? Because what she was saying was every call I make has to turn into a sale. And I said, well, the thing is, we're not there yet. We'll get there fast, but what you've got to do to start with is say to yourself, every day, because I've never, ever made calls like this, I have to make a call. And that's the objective. I have to dial the number and stay on the phone till they say hello. And if it all turns into a car crash, well, that doesn't matter because I've achieved my objective. The people listening to this who think that is weak, okay, are the people that don't need that. If you're shy and introverted and you're told, just get on with it anyway, it's not the right language for you. You won't work with it, and this is what you need instead. It is much more effective. So uh, hopefully that helps, and, and Vanu, that, that really should help as well. Just recalibrate your objectives to participate. That's all you need to do. Danny here, you've uh, written, I'm, I've, I've, got the, I've got to refocus and get on and do it. I've got the mind, power, and ability 
to cold core or whatever, but swinging between the confidence to follow through and the introvert side of me forever. Is that war going on? Look, there'll always be a discussion. You'll always have this dialogue with yourself, right? You'll always be saying, because now our natural state is to not want to bother doing anything, is to save energy, right? Our natural state, if possible, is to lay around and do nothing, okay? It, in the ideal world, you might say, uh, my natu your natural state is to sit about and read a book or play video games and just simply indulge our base urges, eat, cons you know, consume sweet stuff, have sex and play addictive games, that stuff as suits our base urges but the reality is we can be better people if we don't do that and, and that's why you've got to tap into it but there is that mechanism you've got to use so hopefully that helps um, if you have any more questions about sales put them on here now give me I'm trying to get the comments out of the way so put the comments on here let's ask and answer your questions um, but this kind of thing is really important um, so there's another thing I wanted to share, which is this idea about um, when you're working with, as some people call them gatekeepers, which is a bit derogatory, isn't it? It's like it's like a receptionist is is uh, defending something. But when you're trying to get, uh, when you're working with receptionists or PAs or whatever to try and reach, if this is a business to business call, you're trying to reach the top guy. So many people are saying, and I, this came up a lot yesterday, so I was answering it for, for, um, for one of the sales teams I was coaching. They said, um, what about if I say, uh, you know, if, if I say, are they busy or are they available? You know, I'm trying to, trying to reach Mr. Jones. Is he available, please? The thing is, right, think about the language you're actually using. The person you're trying to reach, if they're a top decision maker in a business, they shouldn't, they should, they should be busy. They should be. You, you're not ever going to find a situation where someone isn't busy. And if you are, you should be concerned, right? So looking for that moment when someone's not busy so they can have a chat with you, if this is a cold call, by the way, then it's kind of stupid language to be using. It's like saying, are, are they available as well? Is he available? Well, you know, we could, we could be a little bit over semantic about it, but the reality is if you say if someone's available, the answer is going to be no, because they shouldn't be. They should be busy at work. So you need to change that. The question you really should be asking instead of is, uh, you know, is she busy, please? Uh, as in, can I get hold of her? Is she busy? Or is he available? The question you should be asking is, are they in the office? Okay? Because if they're in the office, you then want to speak to them. Simple as that. Because if it's a cold call and you're coming out of thin air to call this person, it's not booked or on anyone's agenda, okay, then they're going to be busy doing something else. But the idea is that what you have is so interesting that when you, then you speak to them about it, they will want to drop what they're doing to get hold of you, okay? If, if your answer, if your question is, is met with the answer, you know, yes, they are uh, in the office, well, then you should say, great, can I speak to them, please? And then it's for them to say, well, no, he's in an important board meeting, they can't, he can't be disturbed. And then we move on from there. But normally it's like, yeah, okay, no problem, because, because you've asked the right kind of question. Don't ask if people are busy or, or, or available. These are tiny little changes that make, massive cha you know, make, it, make a massive impact in terms of getting through to people. Um, so, so think on that if you're the kind of person who's doing that kind of thing. Um, Manpreet, thanks very much for your uh, question. So you've asked here, what advice are you, uh, if you are starting in sales? And Manpreet, we're having a chat later today, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, by the way, this is a good point to, to ask it, uh, to say it. If anyone wants to have a strategy call with me, I think it's 45 minutes or an hour one-on-one, uh, -on -one, then I'm offering them for free for all of May, okay? So normally I charge $250 for an hour, um, but if you want to speak with me one-on-one, -on -one, so we would have a Skype call, and we can talk about whatever you want about your business, doesn't have to be sales, then you need to go to go, G-O, dot rmmentoring.com, okay? Go to rmmentoring.com, and there's a schedule, you just pop your email address in, there's a video to give you some detail, but if you schedule, um, uh, a time with me, then you get to have that call. Um, obviously, the re this rest of this week is done. I'm looking at my board is absolutely chock a block. Most of next week, I think, is booked up as well. Um, but then the week after would be free. If you're interested in doing that, if that's of importance to you, look, there's no obligation, right? And y you'll lose nothing other than 45 minutes of your time 
and if it's a waste of time, which no one's ever said that it has been, if it's a waste of time, you've lost 45 minutes. But it might be a really good opportunity for you to get someone on the phone who's built businesses for the best part of 15 years and ask questions, even if it's using me as a sounding board, right? Even if you don't take my advice, but you have someone as a sounding board, that might be worth doing. So go.rmmentoring.com, <coughs> completely free. Okay, so just for May, I'm doing this. So if there's so many people, I know it's really great that you're, you're uh, booking yourselves in. Uh, just make sure you get in there quick. If it's of interest, just execute on it, do it. Um, and then, uh, but, but sooner rather than later. We can do a phone call. Well, someone's writing something down there. Uh, can we do a phone call on Messenger, normal phone line or Skype call? Yeah, it's whatever. We'll, what we'll do is a video call on Facebook Messenger or Skype call or something like that. It's no problem at all. But normally it's, it's just, I, I like to do a video call because then we can see each other and have a proper chat rather than the phone. It's 2017 after all, you know. Uh, but Manpre, your question is, what advice if you're starting in sales? So there's thousands of things I could say. But the, the, the main thing is make sure you speak to the right person, okay? I mean, there's so many things I could say right now popping into my head. But firstly, make sure you speak to the right person. Secondly, understand if you're starting in sales, understand it takes time to get used to how to sell. It gets to, to get used to yourself because you don't know how you're going to work with sales. You've got to get used to your emotions as well. The weirdest thing in sales that you learn about yourself, because it's, a, it's a, often a journey of discovery when you're, when you're selling. The weirdest thing you learn is that when you're doing great or feeling good, you get good results. When you're feeling rubbish, you get bad results. And the good or bad results actually should have nothing to do with how you feel. But it's a fact that someone who's feeling down in the dumps and rubbish about sales, they tend to not do very well. Someone who's full of confidence and does great because they believe in themselves, uh, they tend to get results, okay? And when you get good results, you tend to get more good results. And this is how it is. So be aware of your emotional state. If you're having a rubbish time, it's probably because you're, you know, as in if you're getting rubbish results, it's probably because you're in a bad state and you need to change that. Confidence is everything. If you can, if you got it, you've got to use it. Okay, um, but but yeah, make sure that you you bear in mind that you've got to speak to the right person. Tell them a great story, give them great facts. Be authentic. Be you. Don't call people sir or madam. Just be normal, and people really respond to that. If you want to check out the basics of sales course, you can do it on eightstepstartup.com, but that would really help. But if just starting out in sales, keep it really simple and speak to the right person. That's the main thing I would say to start with. There's thousands of other things we could talk about, but you don't need to get too advanced. Try and be normal. Try not to be cheesy. Try not to use lines. Try not to be like a game show host because people don't like that. That's bullshit and people don't like that kind of way of, of people being hustled. It's, it's really quite irritating and you know nowadays we're constantly bombarded by people trying to sell things. The more normal and casual you are the better you do I promise you. So just don't overdo it, okay? Also focus on, you know, there's so many things I could say that pop into my head here, but you know, focus in on basics in terms of talk about the benefits, okay, of your product. Don't describe your product in terms of its features. The benefits are how your solution will help the person you're speaking to, not how it works, okay? There's a major difference. So if I'm selling cars, I wouldn't describe the car. I would tell the person how the car will benefit them. There's a difference. So there's features that describe the product. There's benefits is how it helps the person uh, or brings value to the person who might be buying it. Okay, so do focus more on the benefits. <coughs> And ask questions as well. Listen, ask questions, make them feel part of the conversation. Otherwise you end up being one of those salespeople who just talks at people. Boring as hell, no one's interested. Keep it simple and authentic. Be yourself, be personable. Remember as well that connection and relationship and people buying into you, people buy people, the cliche, is so much more powerful than any sales technique, okay? If someone likes you, right, 
they will buy. Back in 2005, so what's that, 12 years ago now, I was given a number of um, new products to launch for a company I was working with. Um, so these, are, these were six brand new websites, industry portals, and no one was advertising on them at that stage. There was literally no one there. And uh, our other products had companies on them, but we had none on there. And I was getting people to advertise and market their solutions onto these six websites. And to start with, the response I got was, well, why don't you call me when it's working? Why don't you call me when people have joined? Why don't you call me when you've got some established success? Call me when you get results, rather than, hey, we'll take a punt on this. So when I changed the focus to getting on with someone, I focused less on delivering a script and describing this concept I had. I would focus more on connecting with someone. I started getting sales more because people were saying to themselves, you could see it happening on the phone calls. They were saying to themselves, I like this guy. I believe in him. He's a good guy. I want to find a way we can make this work. And sure, not every sale was full rate. Some of them we gave them discounts and things like that to incentivize it. But, but the reality was that so much power was in them believing in me and buying into me as a person <coughs> that superior products that probably cost less money weren't getting their money. They were spending it with us instead because there was a bit more buy-in. So the connection to you is crucial. Simple as that. Uh, next question there from Manpreet. How do you get clients? Well, it depends on the product. There's a lot of different uh, ways of getting clients, of course. Uh, one way to look at it in 2017, if, for instance, you take social media, getting clients should be a give approach, okay? Not give, 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 and then take necessary. Just focus on giving, and eventually people will then come to you. The reason why um, people come to me and say, I'd like you to... Um, to, to be a consultant for my business, please. Could you sit on my board? Uh, or could, could I pay you for three months work or something like that? Isn't because I'm out there on the phone pitching them, it's because I'm giving value as much as I can, uh, you know, just as a matter of course. And then the people are saying, you know what, I get, I get this, what this guy does, it feels good, uh, I, I, I feel like I'm getting a lot of value, I'm gonna reach out to them instead. So getting clients, it, I take the long view on it, I take, I take the, 5, 10, 15 year view of I'm just going to be as valuable as, as possible and then people will come to me. And hey, it couldn't, it couldn't be working better right now. I can't, like this week I had a, uh, um, a massive consulting job drop in and it's purely because of a guy who'd heard about what I'd done in London, who loved the sound of it, who'd spoken to one of my clients, and he's like, I just love this kind of thing you're doing, I think it's perfect, I've had two meetings with him already, and it looks like we're gonna go ahead, and it's, you know, none of that was me approaching people, it's because you're, you're giving good value all the time. If you want a quick win immediately, well yeah, you're gonna have to get on the phone and try and push people in. But getting clients should be based on your, your Aura or, or um, you know, kind of your, the, the self, yourself being a, a really interesting person who gives great value and it being authentic. There won't always be people that like you. It's funny, you know, um, I, I put out a post yesterday that huge amounts of people really liked. And then there's one person commented on it and was going on about how, oh, you know, male entrepreneurs. And, and, and I was like, you don't know anything about me, but she has a problem with me for some reason. Who, who cares? It doesn't matter. You'll never, you'll never get everyone to love what you do. But if you give enough, there'll be someone who comes out and says, you know what, that could, that could really help me. And they reach out to you. So playing the long game is far more fulfilling. Don't focus on trying to get the cash now. Focus on giving stuff to people and you get actually higher rewards. To get far more money. Look, I worked in the city. I was very privileged to work in, in the city for 10 years uh, and earn really good money. But um, it's far more stimulating and it pays way better when you work for uh, work in this approach instead. Okay, so I uh, hope that helps a bit. Um, let's go to the next question. Danny here. I'm just trying to move down because there's so many questions. So Danny here, uh, sales question. What do you think for me starting out would be a better road to focus on? Should I aim to be promoting and selling smaller, cheaper items or step up and aim for the higher ticket uh, sales? I've been asked to launch a farmer's market and a flea market, which are all low cost items, but still better than nothing, right? There's a book you should check out, uh, it's over here by Raju and Zhang. I actually was in touch with um, uh, John Zhang um, 
uh, about two years ago. I think he's at, um, what school is he at? Uh, he is at one of the American schools, uh, Wharton. Sorry, Wharton School. Um, and he's one of their, he's a professor of marketing at Wharton. There's a book called Smart Pricing, and uh, John Zhang helped me uh, with some of the 8stepstartup.com course. So all of these professors and business leaders were piling in and giving advice and things to, to build the lessons for it. So check out 8stepstartup.com, so there's some inf information in there. And what he talks about, some of the ideas in, in Smart Pricing, because they took a look here, how Google, Priceline, and leading businesses use pricing innovation for profitability. It's quite a handy book for understanding pricing. What he talks about is this idea of pruning customers. Now pruning customers, what it means is <clears throat> deciding on customers who spend very little all the way up to those who spend huge amounts, usually in your back end, uh, back loaded, uh, uh, high ticket products, deciding if you're going to prune customers and taking them away altogether. So saying, I'm not going to bother with the low ticket ones, I'm only going to work on the, on the high ticket ones. Um, what I suggest is automating as just this is a general answer first Danny before I get into yours but automate as much as is possible the uh, the low end uh, low ticket sale uh, product items and then focus on you and your time being used for the high end uh, so it's the back end high ticket products so that's what I do for instance so uh, sales of eight step startup and, and um, uh, you know basic sales course and things like that all of those sales are typically automated through ads and funnels and things like that, rather than the consulting I do, which requires me, for instance. So the alternative to automating is outsourcing, right? So you outsource or automate low ticket products. So what I'm not saying is you cut them out altogether, you decide one or the other, you should try and do both. Because the people who buy your low ticket products if they like it, they'll then buy your higher ticket products and then you move away back to the end and they spend loads more money with you. And in fact, before the low ticket products, you'll have free touch points, such as a live Q&A on a Thursday at 1 p.m. GMT, right? So the point is that if people like this kind of thing, they say, hey, I might try something else. And enough people get, of course, there's, if you get enough people through distribution channels and networks and things like that, that um, like your free stuff, then a load of them will like your low ticket stuff and then more will like your higher ticket stuff and so on. You end up with a trickle of people still even buying your, your back end stuff where, you know, the high ticket products where you actually make your real uh, income from. And um, so I would suggest as much as is possible, you should do all of these things. OK, uh, morning, William, good to see you here. And so but if we look specifically at your product area, so we've got, uh, should I aim, oh, I'm trying to get any of these questions, should I aim to be promoting and selling smarter, cheaper items? What I would suggest you do, Danny, is look to have, um, to optimize this process. You're trying to do everything, which is too much. You need to automate the process by outsourcing to other people to do this for you. Erica Rezaire, who I think is listening here, has just liked that point as well. Think about this. OK, I know, I know this is one of the most successful people um, in terms of she can't move for customers. It's outrageous. Over, you should check out Candy, Tr Cre uh, Candy Tree Baltimore, uh, these amazing arts and craft flowers that she makes for weddings and uh, photo shoots and things like that. And she's crushing it. There's so many people coming in to buy her stuff and she's got a team. But the, the job is with the low ticket products. So I think there's some uh, small ticket products that she has they're automated sales through Etsy, for instance. You need a team of people who are bought in. If you can't afford to pay them, give them some equity, okay? And that's what I'd suggest, Danny. You focus on the high ticket stuff, the stuff where you're the, the face of the business and you're doing the big things that require your time. You can't do everything because you will burn out eventually because you'll simply not have the space to be able to grow and you'll just be grinding for everyone else. It's just not a good idea. So. I would say if you're going to launch a farmer's market and flea market, which are low ticket items, see what you can outsource or automate or put to other people. That really is a wise way of looking at it. Um, or do one thing at a time. You know, I, would, I think I was saying to someone the other day, I've got, I think it, I worked out it was like nine different uh, revenue uh, or income streams. Okay, so, but I didn't start nine. I started one. 
you know, and I made that work. And then I started the next one, then I grew the next one. So, so rather than just jumping in with them all, do one at a time. Why do you need to start both at the same time? Maybe do one and build it, make it work, then go to the next one, try it that way. So hopefully that helps. I could go on all day about this, but Danny, you can PM me if, that, if uh, you need a bit more help. Uh, just keep going to the next questions, authentic benefits, uh, yep. Good, uh, so I'm just trying to get through the next question. If you have any more questions, do uh, post them here. Um, so Danny's written, automate low ticket items via online store perhaps. Absolutely right. And what I'm saying, so just to answer this point here, if you're selling things and you're thinking maybe I could sell those things online that would help automate things, yeah. But what I'm saying is you can go a step further. Why not outsource the automation? Get someone you trust to run the online store for you and give them a cut of the profits. So this is something I've done in the past. I've said to myself, I need to sell X. I don't have the time. So why don't I focus on automating the sales of that? I still don't have time to set that up. I'll bring in someone I trust because I won't be able to do it at all otherwise and they can do it for me and in empowering them to do it, they can be my VP of online sales and I'll give them 30% or, or, or whatever, uh, you know, or, or like 10% equity or something like that on that part of the business. And as a result, that person has ownership of a project, they eat what they kill, which means that as well as they do is as well as they make uh, money. So they, they're really excited and inspired by it but also it means I get my things sold, okay? So think about that, you can leverage people. And when I was in touch with Jeffrey Garrett, who's the uh, Dean of Wharton, because I was sticking on the Wharton thing, um, he said, Richard, there's an ecosystem nowadays. That's really the word to use that describes this entrepreneurial world you're in. And that's what people should make use of. So don't worry so much about hiring people or trying to find the money. Like give equity to someone for that part of your business uh, who is good at what they do. I do this all the time. Rather than going learn the nuances of Facebook ads to be world class at it, get someone who's really good at it to do it. And he, I, I have a guy who works with me who looks after that, who has a team of people around them who are good at that in turn and each one does a different component and yeah they make a load of money and I get what's called a bit of a haircut so I lose a bit of the money I otherwise would have made but without them I would never have done it in the first place because I don't have the time the low ticket stuff automate and outsource the rest is then down to you you know to do the stuff you really want to do so then it allows me to do stuff like the public speaking the content generation and the consulting which is the stuff I really like to do uh, um, and that that takes a lot of time anyway okay so hopefully that helps uh, uh, Danny uh, just checking any more questions here okay <clears throat> so I'll just finish up here and unless, unless there are any other questions um, I did have one question, I can't remember who sent it through, but he, he wrote, uh, Richard, when promoting my page on Facebook, should I target those already liking my page to warm them up, or should I target cold traffic? Um, I think anyone listening to this will know, will know what I'm like. I'm, I would, my answer to that is do both, surely. Um, so what you don't want to do, though, is, is do both with the same approach. Okay, So if people like your page on Facebook you should be retargeting them or targeting them specifically with your ads to give them greater value. Because <clears throat> the mistake a lot of people make is when someone gets some value, Danny, I'm glad that helped, That's, uh, thanks for the comment. Um, when someone gets some value, a cold prospect feels that they've got some value from you. The mistake people make is that they jump in and they try and sell them. What you need to do is validate their decision to spend some time engaging with you by giving them more value. So when someone is given value by you and they thank you for it, you then give them more value, okay? Because then they start thinking, do you know what? I'm getting now more in return and it's perpetuating. And that's when people will say, do you know what? I'm gonna share this video. I'm gonna share this comment. I'm gonna share this idea. I'm gonna share this PDF or this downloadable document. And you have that word of mouth thing benefiting you. So. <clears throat> you need to make sure that you target people who are already liking your page and give them some extra love. Uh, I, this happened recently actually. There's a guy who I've bought something from in the past and he's got a retargeting list with people who have bought his product or a particular product. They then get access to a different type of product. So give them a little bit extra and make them feel, okay, that's nice because I bought that previous thing, you're now getting me some more things as well. So it validates their decision to have invested in you in the first place. Don't just try and sell it them necessarily, give them some special level value. Um, and then 
targeting cold traffic yeah of course you should target cold traffic but maybe with a slightly different approach okay so the answer is yes to everything the problem this is just one one thing to finish on guys a lot of the questions i receive are often uh black or white that often should i do this or should i do this and what I want you just to a final thought to leave you with is I want you to start thinking to yourself when I feel I have an option, this is a big thing for me that I often do. When I feel I have an option, I want you to think to yourself, can I do both? OK, should I do traffic? So I do an advert in this direction or an advert in this direction. What about if I did both? What would that look like? OK, now be careful because I only mentioned 10 minutes ago to Danny's question about starting a farmer's market and a flea market and something else as well, that you shouldn't be doing too much at once. Do one thing really well. What I'm saying is within that, when you have options, ask yourself, could I run both? Maybe you could run both uh, types of market at the same time. You could run a farmer's market, Danny, and a flea market in tandem as part of the same market. And maybe that's a way you could do both. But always ask yourself, is there another angle or another way of looking at this? It's not always black and white. It's not always, can I do this or can I do this? Should I do this or should I not do this? It's, could I do both? Is there a half way? Is there something in between I could do instead? Or is there another way I can incorporate everything all together? Look at things in different, different ways because sometimes you'll find that rather than this or that, actually doing both will give you an even better result, okay? Anyway, I'll leave it at that. It's been really great to get back. I think this is like episode, what was this, episode 36 or something like that. Uh, I was finding it hard to count them, to be honest. Um, but I welcome anyone else's comments. Thank you so much. I think there's been quite a few comments on this today. It's been great to catch up with you all. Remember, if you want a free one-on-one, -on -one, okay, with me, 45 minutes, I think it is, you need to go to go, G-O, it's not www, it's go dot rmmentoring.com rm for richard moore uh and you can book yourself uh, a free hour um if you've already had uh, uh if you've won in the past or had free time with me maybe give something give some space to someone else because we've already booked up this week and most of next week as well and i think some of the week after now so um there's only a few slots left but uh, yeah if you want to just shoot the breeze even if you want someone as a bad you know as a bad um What's it called? A bad, uh, not a bad, uh, yeah, uh, a sounding board's the word. Uh, then, then make sure that you do that because because we might it might be that we can solve some real problems for you. So get in touch. Uh, and in the meantime, thanks so much for listening, and I'll catch up with you really soon. Take care. Bye bye.